But uh, Matthew 19, verses 24 through 26. I was asking him earlier about Israel. I seen some photos of somebody with the prayer shawls on social media. And I went to Israel in 2018. And I want to tell you, that's a life changing experience. But I want to tell you this, Christianity was birthed out of Judaism. So it's good, it's always good to have a good knowledge of your roots in the spirit. You from Israel? I see, I see some pointing. Amen. But that, no, that's okay. And uh, in, I, in fact, I was so excited uh, when I went, I wanted to know how to speak it. And I'm about 40% in the ancient Hebrew and modern Hebrew. So whenever I went there, I was able to speak a little bit to the uh, Israeli people. And, uh, but nonetheless, always have a heart for Israel and pray for Israel. Pray for it. God will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. But let me stop right there. He's speaking specifically to one man because we learned after the crucifixion there was a rich disciple who went and begged for the body of Jesus. So it's a different type of attitude in how you take it. Like I preach in Atmore, if we're not careful, we can become possessed, not of the Holy Ghost, but possessed by our possessions. What controls you is your God. What gets your attention and keeps your attention over the house of God is your God. Verse 25. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed. Now, you want to know why they were amazed? They've been, they've been walking with Jesus. They understood him. Jesus just pretty much sucker punched this dude in the face with words. And you're going to learn in their statement whenever they said, who then can be saved? They're questioning Jesus out of sympathy for the man he just insulted. Who then can be saved? Verse 26. But Jesus beheld them, in other words, he kept their attention, and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God. But with God. But with God. All things. Turn to your neighbor and say, All things are possible. Tonight, our topic is very simple. God knows how to thread the needle. God, no God knows how to thread the needle. Lord Jesus, I love you. Father, I hide behind your cross. Let not this flesh glorify. Only your spirit get praise and adoration. I give you honor and praise. Anoint every ear, every heart. Lord Jesus, let us be receptive to what you have to say in this place. We give you praise. And everyone said in Jesus' name. Clap your hands unto him as you're seated. Now, there are Bible scholars that interpret this verse, the eye of the needle, referring to a certain gate in Jerusalem. I actually seen it. It's a pretty, pretty small gate. And um, a camel, in order for a camel to go through it, it has to go down on his knees. Now, you know what a camel looks like. All its weight is above its waist. You know, it kind of looks like a Cajun, like me. You know, all my weight's above my, weight above my waist, and a camel has those small legs. Some of y'all like that too, man. Don't laugh. But, so, but a camel, you ever seen their knees? Look like potatoes. And camel, I don't know if you've seen one in real life, a camel is a pretty big animal. They are big animal. You know, I always tell people all the time, when we were at war with ISIS, they should have sent a group of Cajuns and Creoles from Louisiana to go fight over there because we'd have took away all their artillery. The first night we'd have had camel boudin, camel tasso, camel sausage. We, we'd have took them out quick. But either way, it was very painful for this animal to get down on his knees with all its weight on top of it and crawl to get through this gate. 
sometimes when the camel made it through, there would be skin hanging off of its knees, meat just, kneecaps just pushed through. It could be done, but Brother Palmer, it was painful for the animal. So that's why the Lord said it would be, he was basically speaking to this man, it would be easier right now for that camel to go through an eye of the needle than it would be for you to make it to heaven. Now, I have a question, though, that if a camel can crawl through that tiny gate, which is called the eye of a needle, then what's all this talk about impossibilities? So humor me, if you would, tonight, that Christ was literally talking about the eye of an actual needle. Just follow me. Walk with me here. Now, there are folks that are part of God's church, and there are some that come and go. Like I say in Atmore, we've got all-timers. They're there all the time. Some-timers, part-timers, every other timers. When they feel like it, or when hell breaks loose at home, Come on. Well, it, that, thank you. True. That's exactly what it is. But now there are folks that are part of God's church, like I said, and, and you would think sometimes it would literally take an actual miracle for them to make it, something that no human effort can do. There are things in our life, church, that only God can do. I know we all try to fix things ourselves and do it our own way, but when we get to the point and we realize it's nothing that no human effort can do, but it's something that only God can do. And in this setting, Jesus is speaking to a rich man who asked him the question about eternal life. He said, so Jesus, he says, have you kept my commandments? And the guy says, man, Lord, I've done that from my youth on up. You know what that means? He was religious. He was religious. And there's a major difference between religious people and Christians. There's a difference between religious people and saved people. Religious people love the house of God. Christians love the God of the house. So now Jesus says, okay, well, good. You got your chest poked out. You've been in church your whole life. See if you can swallow this one. Go sell all that you have and follow me. Now the rich man. Like we say down home in Louisiana, he was Boudin, La Fache Maladeu. Oh, shy. So he was mad. So Jesus hits him with that, and then Jesus, right after this man, walks away mad. I'm telling you, he was madder than a midget with a yo yo. He gets, he's mad, you hear me? And so now he walks away, and then Jesus turns to his disciples and says, With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things. Everyone say all things are possible. So what is he saying? There are some things that when we can't do it, God knows how to thread the needle. Say that. God can thread the needle. There are things in life that with men are impossible, but with God, it's all possible. Genesis 18 and 14. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Sarah was 90. Abraham was 100. She had a son. We serve a needle-threatened God. Philippians 4 and 19, by my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. By Christ Jesus, we serve a God that knows how to thread the needle. Matthew 17 and 20, and Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto thee, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, nothing shall be impossible unto you. We serve a God that knows how to thread the needle. Mark 10 and 27, and Jesus looking upon them said, with men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. We serve a God that can thread the needle. Luke 1 and 37, for with God nothing shall be impossible. Mark 9 and 23, Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe all things are possible to him that believeth. Let me tell you, whatever it is your need may be here tonight, God can still thread that needle. We serve a God that specializes in the impossible. 
and he can still thread your needle. God threaded a needle when he saved you, when he kept you. He threaded one when he called you to preach. He threaded one when he called you to be a saint, when he gave you your children, when he supplied for you, when he delivered you, when he healed you. We got any folks in here between the ages of 16 to 21? 16 to 21. Okay. 16 to 20. That's okay. In fact, we can even go a little older than that. 21 to 30. Good. You know what? I've been preaching the gospel now for 13 years. Pastoring for six. And I'm just starting to get gray hair. My wife never caught gray hair until we got married. She says, stress will do that to you. You know, I, I, I'm bivocational. I'm a, I'm a butcher at the Piggly Wiggly in Atmore. So they came in the store the other day, and I didn't even know they were in there. I'm just putting out all the meat. And my youngest daughter says, oh, my God, Daddy's full of blood. And Kenley goes, I've seen Mom beat him worse. tough dude but let me tell you something the devil will offer you everything he can to keep you from where you're at tonight oh well brother go bear i can still be a christian and not go to church on earth as it is okay he put the church on earth for you to experience heaven on earth he gave you the church so you can walk with him on earth you can't be saved and not go to church on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, brother. I know what it's like. I was living my dream. You hear me? Since I was a little bitty boy, you know what I wanted to be? A professional wrestler. Like what you see on television. And you know what? For 11 months of my life, I was doing it. I was doing it all over southwest Louisiana, Lake Charles area, even parts of southwest Texas. I was living my dream. I'd go in there praying for a recruiter, praying for somebody to catch they, that I would catch their eye. And, you know, I was living my dream. Because you know why? I got offered. I got the Holy Ghost at the age of 17. I backslid at the age of 18. You hear me? And I left God. And let me tell you, you think leaving, leaving the church and going into the world is going to make it easy? I promise you, you're going to still feel that conviction every time you pop a pill. You're going to still have the Holy Ghost budging you on the forehead every time you take a sip. You're going to... That world will spit you out, chew you up, and spit you out. You hear me? I know what it's like to wake up in my own vomit. Don't tell me it can't happen. It can happen to any one of you. And the devil, listen, the devil only attacks people he's threatened by. And if you ain't a threat to the devil, he'll leave you alone. So be careful about saying, I want the devil to leave me alone. Well, hello? Today... This is proof. I was just a wild, raging, Cajun Creole in southwest Louisiana, living it up, trying to live my life and be popular and do everything that I can. But I got news for you. People will look at me today, and some of them will still say that I'm fake, I'm a hypocrite. Or what. Look at what they call Jesus. Somebody told me the other day, you know, I don't like you. Well, as we know from the cross, not everybody liked the Lord either. Hello? Come on, somebody. I'm telling you. Guys, what you have right here is the best thing. The best thing. You hear me? If you want your marriage to work, you be in church with your wife every single Sunday. Man, I got news for you. If she said, well, she won't follow my lead. I promise you, if you do it, she will follow. You lead by example. I'm telling you, guys, what you have here is the greatest thing. Thing. I'm telling today, I would have never in my life, somebody who was raised into Roman Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, strict Catholicism, somebody would have told me that I would end up being a Pentecostal preacher, I would have told them to smoke another one. But you know what? We serve a God that with men it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Today you're listening to a threaded needle and it's hard for me to believe it. And yes, it's hard. I'm a first-generation apostolic. 
No one in my family has the Holy Ghost. No one in my family is following this faith. Do I judge them? No, it's not my place to judge them. There's two types of judgment the Bible talks about. You hear me? There's, judge, there's spiritual judgment and passing judgment. Yeah, judge not lest you be judged. If I, if, I, if I tell my daughter, hey, next time I see you, pick your nose, you're going to split hell wide open. She doesn't pick her nose, I do. You know what I do? I just pass judgment on her. But if somebody says, hey, Brother Gobert, I know you're off tomorrow night. Can uh, Let's say we go down to the, the cavern and just hang out and have a little bonfire, and, and I won't tell nobody. No, man, I ain't doing that. That's a spiritual judgment. Paul said in Corinthians, he that is spiritual judges all things. So, yes, if you're spiritual, you're judgmental. So you better learn to just be judgmental. I don't know what your needs are and what your problems are tonight, but nothing is beyond the possibilities of this needle threading God we serve. The same wind that dried up the Red Sea, it still blows. And God still has ravens that will feed his Elijahs today. Uh, And let me remind you that God still has manna in his cabinets to give whoever needs it. The God we serve, he is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. And he knows the end from the beginning. In the Hebrew, that means he's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the A to the Z. He's the A. He's an awesome God. He's a B. He's a believing God. He's the C. He's the Christ God. He's D. He's a delivering God. He's E. He's an eternal God. He's F. He's a faithful God. He's G. He's a great God. He's H. He's a holy God. (coughs) He's I. He's a great I am. He's J. He's a jealous God. He's K. He's King of Kings. And He's L. He's Lord of Lords. He's M. He's a mighty God. He's N. He's a non-stop God. He's O. He's an omnipresent God. He's P. He's a powerful God. He's Q. He's a quick God. He's R. He's a righteous God. He's S. He's a sustaining God. He's T. He's a tough God. He's U. He's an ultimate God. He's V. He's a victorious God. He's W. He's a wonderful God. He's Y, he's your God, and he's Z, he's a zealous God. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and he's still a God that knows how to thread the needle. If you believe that, I got news for you, Mom and Daddy. Your backslidden kids are coming back to church. The problems are going to be solved. Your marriage shall be saved. The God that we serve, he's not out of date, and he's not dead. He still owns a cattle on a thousand hills, and his right hand still has all power. It still has all authority. It still has healing. It still has deliverance. His kitchen still has fishes and loaves that can be multiplied. Lord, there's 5,000. How are we going to feed so many? And then in walks somebody from the youth department. With a happy meal for McDonald's. Don't tell me somebody's too young for God to use in a miracle. When our Bible tells us that a little young boy, doesn't say how young, but I'm guessing real young because his meal wasn't big. So God used a kid, a small kid. Let me tell you something. You are never even spiritually baby enough to where God can't use you. Listen, his first miracle, can anybody tell me what was the first miracle he performed in the Bible? Yes, ma'am. What is it? Huh? What she said? He loves us? Yeah, yes, it's a miracle he loves some of us. (laughs) Yeah, he does, doesn't he? I always tell folks, especially young couples, if you want a successful marriage, Always, every day, tell your spouse these two sentences. Always say you're sorry, and always say I love you. There's not a day that don't go by. Sister Gobert tells me, honey, I'm sorry I love you. (laughs) And we've made 14 years off of that. His first miracle he performed, he turned water into Chardonnay. Now, you got to understand... The New Testament law didn't begin until the resurrection. 
they were still living under the old law. Water was symbolic for judgment in the days of Noah. There's a lot of symbolism in your Bible. In fact, I remember in the mentors class, you, you taught on that in Westlake. And uh, water was symbolic for judgment. Wine, anybody ever seen on a bottle of wine that says, these are made from the finest spirits? Yeah, it's a spirit, all right. I'm just glad I got the right spirit that will make me walk straight and not funny. And then the Lord has to make me bow-footed and flat-footed, and I still walk funny. So he turned, listen to me now, wine was symbolic for joy because it was only used at Jewish festivals and weddings and so forth, joyous occasions. The Lord said, bring me the empty vessel. And he tells them, fill them with judgment. You know, that's how many of us were when we first came to God. Empty and maybe even just full of judgment. We were, we were wrong. We were living wrong. I promise you, you didn't first go to church because you were confident in your salvation. You went because you knew you were lost and undone. You were a vessel filled with judgment. And the Bible says, the Lord looking down, I always used to tell the youth department, he looked at it and it blushed. But he looked at it, placed his hands over it, and the water became wine. The judgment became joy. His first miracle was symbolic to the new birth. I got news for you. Whenever you first came to church and you were emptied and you were full of judgment, he threaded a needle by filling you with his spirit. Now, I'm going to tell you this. There's still one thing in, in God's church that it angers me. I mean, I get madder than a mosquito locked in a mannequin factory. Is when people can come to church and when somebody gets healed, they get up out of a wheelchair or they get healed physically, people will run the aisles like they lost their sanity because somebody got healed or a report came back cancer-free, which is great. But amazingly, when that sinner goes down to the altar and somebody's trying to get the Holy Ghost, here's the rest of the church. The greatest miracle is still the new birth. The greatest miracle is still the baptism of the Holy Ghost. God has never subsided in miracles. He's still performing miracles right now in 2021. I'm telling you the greatest But nothing excites me more than seeing somebody receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and John, and Peter, and Paul. And best of all, he's your God. And he's on your side. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He can still put corns in the mouth of the fish. He can still roll back the Red Sea. He can still dry up rivers and let you walk through. He can still cast mountains into the ocean. He's the one who raised Lazarus from the dead. He's the one who opens eyes, and he's the one who opens ears. Anybody ever said to themselves, listen, I had a lady not long after I first started pastoring. She had just quit coming to church all of a sudden. Didn't know why. You know, a lot of times when folks who's normally tearing up in worship, worship every Sunday, then they come back one service and all of a sudden they're like the frozen chosen. That's guilt and condemnation. That's what guilt does. Guilt prevents you from worshiping because you don't feel worthy enough to worship. Well, I got news for you. When you mess up, that's when you need to worship the most. That's when you need to worship the most. Worship your way through it. And you know, and I'm just be real, some folks when they miss church, they see pastor in Walmart. <laughs> and I don't follow them down. I don't. I never do. I just don't do it. I just let them have their, their moment, their day. So be it. But this one day I was moved. 
I walked up to this lady at a gas pump. I said, sister, where you been? She immediately broke down. She goes, oh, brother, go there. The devil has been stalking me. I said, really? She goes, oh, God, he's at home. He follows me to work. He's followed me here to the Chevron. He follows me everywhere I go. What do you think I should do? Take him to church. Does not the psalmist say that the enemy, the Lucifer, he enshackles himself with you? Anybody here ever been worked in corrections or anything? I worked in corrections as, as a sheriff's deputy. And we put these chains on people. We got a line tenant sending them to 72-hour court. And when one takes a right step, they all got to take a right step. If one of them does this, the whole group does it. And if the devil is going to enshackle himself and stalk me, not only am I going to take him to church, he's going to be my worshiping partner. Because when I lift my hands, he's got to lift his hands. When I begin to stomp my feet, he's got to stomp his feet. He is alive and well. Elijah's God lives today. He's the ancient of days. He's the prince of peace. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the great physician. He's the everlasting father. He's the lamb of God. He's the anointed one. Is shall I continue on his resume? He's the almighty God. He's Jehovah Jireh. Now, we in 2021, has anybody not heard the term asymptomatic? Because a sneeze is coming. No. Asymptomatic. What is it? This was the guy, you know, that, that looks like an older version of Pee Wee Herman that calls himself a doctor. He gets on there and he's like, well, asymptomatic means you're a carrier. Oh, yeah, fa faucet, whatever, something. Yeah, somebody left him leaking a long time ago. <laughs> if this gets put off of YouTube, it ain't because of your pastor. It's because of me. I get censored on Facebook all the time for what I preach. First time I ever got pre preached, uh, I called Nancy Pelosi a gum-sucking, what was it I called her? It was something. She was a doofus. And she was sitting there while Trump was talking. I said to myself, I hope she swallows her dentures. <laughs> She's just sitting there full of the devil. Asymptomatic. It means you got the, you got the bug, but you don't have the symptoms. Now listen, when you have a cold, nobody has to teach you how to cough. Nobody's got to teach you how to sneeze. Nobody has to teach you to have a runny nose. Nobody, nobody has to teach you how to run to the bathroom. If the bug is in, the symptoms are coming out. Hello? I don't understand folks who say they got the Holy Ghost but can't worship. Listen, the demoniac of Kadera had 6,000 devils in him. And where did he live? Anybody tell me where he lived? A graveyard. Ah, here we go. I'm going to tell you all something. I promise you the head cashier at Walmart can figure it out. He had 6,000 demons, and he lived in a graveyard. Because you know why? A place of death felt like home because of the spirits that was inside of him. That's why the Bible says he was like breaking every chain they put on him. He had superhuman strength because nothing was going to stop him from leaving his safe haven. I don't understand folks that say they got the Holy Ghost, but they're allergic to church. You know what that tells me? Stubbornness can have a stronger hold on you than 6,000 devils. That's exactly what that means. Church ought to be a place where if you've got the Holy Ghost, it's a place where you feel at home. This is a place where you need to come and recharge your battery. This is a place where you need to come and touch God. 
You want because you know what? You lived out in the world for six days a week, and it's time to get a refill. You can. If I get out of line, let me know. I respect this man in this pulpit too much. But asymptomatic. Did not the Lord say in the last days that people would give him lip service? Saying they love him and blessing him with their name, but their hearts are far away from him. The Bible says he's coming back for a bride that's made herself ready. He's not coming back for an asymptomatic church. He's not coming back for asymptomatic worship. He's not coming back for asymptomatic givers. He's not coming back for asymptomatic praisers. Those who just want to come and see church as a social club. I tell the, ch the church in Atmore, I got up and I hit him with a little brain deal. I said, I'm going to put an ATM in the church. And they had a, you know how they were looking at me? Same way some of y'all are looking at me right now. What's an ATM? You put your information in it and you can withdraw from it. You can even put in, or but mainly an ATM is for withdrawal. Every single church in the house of God should have ATM. Acceptance, truth, and mercy. That means when a sinner walks in, they ought to be able to withdraw, withdraw acceptance. Let me tell you something. If you don't love them and accept them, the Baptist church will. If you don't love them and accept them, the Methodist church will. If you don't love them and accept them, the charismatic church will. Acceptance, truth. They ought to know truth. The truth is the only thing that will set them free. I don't plan on tickling people's ears and being a motivational speaker like that dummy down in Houston, Captain Smiley Pie. With your generous donation of $500, shut up. I'm telling you. Listen, I was in Lake Charles, Louisiana. I probably shouldn't do this, but I was in Lake Charles, Louisiana one time, me and Sister Gobert both. And that dude was sitting in there with another preacher. He was preaching at a big charismatic church in Lake Charles, Louisiana. And I kid you not, Brother Palmer, that dude had makeup on. That dude had makeup on. His watch, which was very small, was coming down the, the forearm. And I was, he's a girly man. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, and he's talking and he's, I'm like, he don't do all of that on TV. I told my wife, I said, I think the dude got sugar in his tank. And they got people that will go to that church, not because of who he is, but because he tells them what they want to hear. We don't need none of that. The truth and only the truth will set you free. If people hate you for preaching the truth, preach the truth anyway. You're still going to get a crown. My God, I'm telling you, there's, when it was a religion, no religion with a cross is not a real religion. There's no cross, no crown. There has to be sacrifice. There has to be something. There has to be somebody with enough faith that can go to the house of God and say, God, what I can't do, you can do, because with you all things are possible. Yeah. Nothing is impossible with this needle threading God. Listen, some of us, we can come to church with addictions. You guess what? When I got received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and prayed back through, I still had addictions. Pain pills? <clears throat> Not a problem. I gave up somas and lower tabs like that. Alcohol? Not a problem. I remember what it was like waking up the next morning from a wrestling event and having to go to work the next day. Two shots of wild turkey and two lower tabs. That was breakfast. That was breakfast. You hear me? And then I was from a night of partying wild and wild partying, hard partying. You hear me? Stuff that I'm not proud of. But if it wasn't for that stuff, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. Don't regret nothing from your past where the devil has pulled you from. Don't regret it. You know what? I come from a religion. I knew better than to say something against that priest that I called father. You hear me? called father and my family taught you say one bad word against that man my god you'll be picking up your teeth if god don't strike you with lightning first so when i got the holy ghost you know what i said brother palmer i said if i can show that much obedience to a man that fed me lies how much more faithful can i be to a man giving me truth you hear me 
Any man that's pastor in a church under 80 people has been wounded. Been wounded before. Pastoring is 24-7. In fact, that disciple I was telling you about, that rich disciple, he went to Pilate. I'm sorry, Herod. He went to Herod. And Herod was like the modern-day antichrist. He was an evil man. You hear me? This disciple went to him and begged for the body of Jesus. A lifeless body. No more miracles. No more feedings. None of that. Nothing that it can do for him. Nothing in return. But he begged for the body and he took it. And he prepared the body because he remembered what he said in three days I shall rise again. Listen, he took the body and he prepared it for his resurrection. Guys, you ought to thank God every day that a man of God went to the king and said, I want this body right here at Lot Road Church. And this man has been taking it and preparing you and preparing you for the rapture, preparing you for your revival. Prepa <laughs> he loves you when you're unlovable. Listen. I've only been in, I've been in ministry only 13 years. How many years have you been in ministry? 25. I'd be an idiot to not listen to him. I promise you there's days he feels like a doormat. I promise you. There's days he hugs you and tells you how much he loves you when he want to slap you. There's times whenever you tell him you love him and appreciate him, rate him, and he's like, no, you don't. You've been gossiping on me all week. But he won't tell you that. And guess what? His wife feels that. His kids feel that. They all feel it. You ought to thank God for a sacrifice that a man is going to take time out of his life, his marriage, and his being a father to give for you and do for you. And it's not always an easy sacrifice. A lot of tearful nights, a lot of crying, a lot of crying for you and your soul. He, he wants you to be saved just as much as you want to be, if not more. You ought to thank God for your man of God, church. You ought to thank God for this man. Hmm. Let's stand. I want to tell you a little bit more about this God. Musicians, you can come, I guess, if, it's okay, if I'm not out of order for calling them up, or however you do it. I want to tell you tonight, there's no broken heart he can't mend. There's no load he can't lift. There's no life he can't salvage. There's no disease he can't heal. You know, I want to tell you something. There's times, I remember when I was a young man. It was my junior year in high school. Um, which, by the way, my heart goes out to teachers today. You got any educators in the house? You got, he's an educator? Sister Hill, okay. Thank God for an educator. Edge, you cater. What are they doing? They're catering you to the edge of your life. And I'm thankful for all of our educators. Pastors are educators. Sunday school teachers are educators. Soul winners are educators. I was at work at Tony Superfoods in Elton, Louisiana. My job, I was making boudin. Anybody know what that is? Oh, we got some cages in here? Well, if not, they gone. But anyway, yeah, not that stuff you buy at Piggly Wiggly. And I don't know what that is. That ain't boudin. I don't, that's poison. Huh? Well, yeah. You, li you live in Louisiana, so you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, eat, eat, yeah. Three for one. Yeah, that's not cage. That's cage. Virginia's good. No, I don't cook with alcohol. I'm picking, brother. I've got to watch this. Yes, Rouse's. I, I bought rue from over there. And my, my wife watched that, that coffee, flavored coffee. What is it that you use? Yeah, yeah, and like uh, birthday cake and French vanilla. Yeah, the guy that owns it, he's from Louisiana. You know, like flavored coffee, all that stuff that feminine and feminine men drink. What's that? 
Yeah, they make boudin over there. That's what I've heard. I never tried it, but I'm going to take your word on it. <laughs> but my best friend in high school, Chris Moran, we were going to go do what we normally do on Fridays. We were going to find a spot out in the woods. We was going to invite some friends. We was going to get a few cases of beer. And we was going to have a bonfire. And let me tell you, when Cajuns Creole have a bonfire, you can see it across the state. It ain't no little bitty bonfire. We have a wildfire. Okay, we, make, we, we know what a bonfire is. And uh, I said, yeah, man. You know, and I pitched in. And, and his dad, which, of course, you know, we weren't going to be on the road. We were staying out in the woods overnight. His dad pitched in. And, man, we had like five or six cases of Miller Lite. And we were going to go home. And uh, he come to pick me up that afternoon when I got off work. My little nephew, Peyton McDaniel, which today I'm forever thankful for God using somebody. He's 21 years old today, but at the time, he was three going on four, I think. And uh, he started crying because he was staying the night with my parents. And he begged me to stay with him. Just begged me to stay. And, there's, and I'm still the same way when, it, when, I, when I see a baby cry, it, it touches me. I, I hate seeing a baby cry. I mean, I, it's almost worse than seeing me cry. And uh, no, really, but I don't like seeing a baby cry. And he started pulling on me. He wanted me to stay and he wanted to play video games and he wanted to kick the soccer ball. And so I told my buddy Chris, I said, man, would you be mad if I sat this one out? I said, I'll tell you what, next Friday, I'll go double. He said, yeah, thank you. That was my nickname, thank you. He said, yeah, thank you, whatever, that's fine. I'll just let them know you're going to miss the next one. He's like, you sure? Because there's going to be a lot of folks. I'm like, yeah, y'all go ahead. So I stayed home that night. Went to work the following morning. Went to open up the store. His dad met me at the door. Who has the Holy Ghost today? We used to all go to St. Paul's Catholic Church. He said, uh, Derek, Chris drove a single cab Ford, 91 Ford pickup. Remember with the two tone colors, the red and the white that he used to have along the way? He said, uh, Derek, he says, last night on the road, uh, Chris got in a car accident. Him and another guy from Iowa, Louisiana lost control of the vehicle, hit a tree head on, got sparks peeling, tree sparks peeling in the door, and the truck exploded. And he said some people who lived right there tried to help him, but all they could hear was those two boys screaming. There was nothing they could do. They burned alive. I was supposed to be in that truck with him that night. I'm not even supposed to be here. Always wonder. What does God have? I wouldn't have my two daughters. I wouldn't have my beautiful wife. I wouldn't be a pastor. I wouldn't be preaching this gospel. God has a purpose for each and every one of you. Young people, you hear me? God has a purpose. If you can look in the mirror and you can say, it's not possible with God, all things are possible. You hear me? God can thread a needle that you wouldn't have thrown. Walkmans. Yeah, yeah, West Virginia, right? Yeah, y'all like 30 years behind. No, I'm still going to pick with you, man. I love you. But anybody remember a Walkman? You know, had the three buttons, stop, play, and rewind. And if you wanted to fast forward, you had to pull the tape out, turn it around, hit rewind. Anybody remember that? We had a big football game coming up. I always did a little extra one though when it came to wanting to we to be the team. We had just played that Friday night. We had lost to South Boulevard. The following Friday night, we had a big rivalry, Elton High School versus St. Edmund High School out of Eunice, Louisiana. And uh, I really took that game serious. And right where I live, there's a railroad track. Anybody live by a railroad? After a while, 
all, you didn't hear doing that train, uh, that big whistle. You didn't hear it no more. No. You get used to it. It's like, exactly. Our, yes. I, I lived in a single wide trailer growing up, and folks would come visit, and they're like, does that ever annoy y'all? What? We didn't even hear it anymore. Sister Gobert, y'all lived in what? In Mississippi? In Boniface. When you live by Yeah, you don't you don't even you don't even recognize it anymore. And I had a I was jogging on a railroad crossing, had my Walkman on. Which, by the way, you know, anybody ever seen somebody move into a Walkman? You remember back in the day? I can remember going to work, and guys would have CD Walkmans. And, man, I remember one time on my lunch break, I seen this dude. I didn't even know he had it. He had it inside his Nomex, and he was there. I'm like, did that dude get wormed or something? Did he have all his shots? Like, oh, stop. But anyway cold outside, so I took that hat off and the walkman. See, he was listening to a voice that nobody else can hear. And I'm telling you right now, in 2021, for the church, God is looking for walkmans. God is looking for people who's tuned in. He's looking for people who are tuned in that's going to hear his voice. A voice that nobody else can hear. was jogging two weeks later to the day on that railroad crossing, Brother Palmer. And I remember when I got off the main road, I felt something hit my heel of my shoe and just swipe the back tail end of my shirt. And I was like, what? I turned around and all I seen was hell. That ain't you. Couldn't hear nothing. I remember it like yesterday. I remember it. I was listening to my favorite cassette tape. It was Metallica. The album low, song King Nothing. I'll never forget it. And I was just jogging and just getting with it. You know? And I was like, where's your friend? Huh. I'd have missed my friend if I'd have got to hear it. You hear me? And it's like, God, listen. See why you're still here. Things that you thought in your life was going to take you out, but God threaded the needle over and over and over and over and over again. Sis, I don't know your name. Christy, Christina, I want to tell you something. God's not looking for perfection, He's just looking for commitment. Anybody ever said, God, all I do is try? She, she knows me because I still I haven't graduated to a bicycle yet. I still ride a tricycle. Well, I do ride a bicycle from time to time. Sometimes my wife will go put in the back seat for me. But before a bicycle, you learn. You learn at the very beginning to ride a tricycle. How many wheels does a tricycle have? Three. Three tri, three wheels. When you're walking with God early, you're going to face three wheels. The will of God, the will of the devil, and your will. And that's at the tricycle. The two back wheels are the smallest. You better make sure that's the enemy's wheel and your wheel. The biggest wheel has to be God's wheel. Because you know why? If you keep your hand on God's wheel, that's the only way you can steer. Goodbye, world. Hello, kingdom. Listen. Trying to live for God 
is living for God. That is living for God. You're going to mess up. That's why you have the church. We don't come here because we're perfect. We don't come here because of how holy we are, how righteous we are. We come here because we mess up and we've been trying and we've been falling. But because of his mercy, he threads that needle every single time. I want to open up these altars. I want to tell somebody here tonight, the pain you're experiencing is a gift. How would we know he's a healer if you don't ever get sick? How would we know he's a deliverer if you never get caught in a pit? If you never get put in a fiery furnace in life? If you, ever, if you never had a trial, how can we know he's a deliverer? I want to tell you something. The devil is a prophet in reverse the Bible says he's a liar he's the father of liars and there's no truth in him so he can only tell a lie which is the opposite of truth so the next time the devil says you'll never get healed you better start shouting because that means your healing is on the way when the devil says that your marriage can't be saved, you ought to start dancing and shouting because your marriage is about to be restored. When the devil says that your finances will never get better, you need to start praising God and saying, I've got a blessing on the way. Let's worship the Lord as they sing. Let's worship him. Let's worship this God that still knows how to thread the needle. still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus and your voice is calling me out and right 